what that uh, video just leaves me speechless uh, every time I take a look at it. It's really takes me back to um, being in Ghana and being with all those wonderful people. Well, um, I want to thank uh, certainly BJ and, and Don for kicking us off this morning. I don't know where all of the rest of you were last night, but Don and Em and I closed the place down. So where was the rest of the crowd? <laughs> you guys went to bed early. You got a lot of sleep, I'm sure. Um, I also wanted to mention, as I looked at this video, it's a good thing I wasn't dancing in the video because my children would tell you that it would be very embarrassing had I done that. So um, at any rate, as I think about our time together this morning, there's a popular saying that comes to mind and it is, in this world, talent is universal, but opportunity is not. And as you heard from Don, more than 40 years, Opportunity International has unlocked the door. Um, and as I think about being with you all last night and um, being with this extended family since I joined this wonderful organization, um, we certainly talk a lot about um, the banks and the infrastructure and the technology, but in reality, Opportunity is much more than an NGO. It is a quilt of friendship, collaboration, trust, and honor. Um, and in that spirit, a couple of things I want to mention, and that is that uh, in that spirit of family and friendship, uh, we have a new member to the Opportunity family. PT and AT Chewbacca have a new grandson, and his name is Justice and he joined our family yesterday. So will you join me in a round of applause? Congratulations. I wish you, should, I wish you could have seen A.T. at the board meeting yesterday. He was literally out of his seat with love and enthusiasm. And I was having um, a moment to spend this morning with my good friend, Ambassador Tony Hall. And Tony was saying, you know, I've traveled to over 150 countries around the world. And he will speak to this later this morning. He said, but Opportunity International is the best organization providing microfinance in the world. And he certainly is an expert. So um, just briefly, you all know the facts. I would share with the group that we have about 200 people that are with us uh, over the next day and a half, and half are folks that have been a part of our family for many years, and half are brand new. And that's a really wonderful mix and blend to have uh, as we uh, share our stories and talk about our work, uh, to have folks that know our work and folks that are interested in knowing our work. Uh, but for those of you who are new to us, we provide services to 4 million people. We um, know that, that there are 3 billion people that are living on less than $2 a day. And that opportunity is what really lifts those folks um, out of poverty. So, um, while I'm new to this work, I am not new to this mission. Um, I grew up, as I said in the video, um, in a small town in Georgia and actually experienced uh, poverty firsthand. My mother was very ill for a number of years and my dad had the very difficult task of trying to raise two small children on a limited salary and paying medical bills, which actually moved him further and further into um, a cycle of poverty. And there were many days that my brother and I didn't have enough food to eat. We didn't have clothes. Um, we certainly didn't have clean clothes to go to school. We didn't have transportation. Um, we were really, really in a tough spot. And 
I can speak firsthand about the shame and humiliation and sense of not belonging. And I will never forget that. It's not something that I talk about a lot, but it is a reason for being here. Um, and I said to our board of directors yesterday that if I had been born in Ghana, I would be a client of Opportunity International. Um, I wanted... I wanted desperately to figure a way out, as I would say most of our clients do. And trying to figure a way out was not easy. Um, trying to just get up in the morning and figure, you know, how are you going to get out of this was very, very tough. But I had um, many people that believed in me and guided me and supported me and invested in me. and. This is the story that I'll be sharing with you today. Uh, those people were my grandmother. I lived with my grandmother off and on throughout my young life. It was my own community and it was my church that really led me to know the way out of poverty in the United States. Um, I was the first person in my family to actually graduate from college. and. I did that through taking out both, I would say, institutional loans and personal loans. And I paid all those loans back to the people that loaned me the money. And I'm forever indebted to those folks. Um, I had the good fortune of, when I graduated, um, I, I applied to join the Peace Corps. And my best friend, said, you know, Vicki, I'm tired of working, and why don't you and I join the airlines? So we did. <laughs> and it seemed like a good thing to do at the time. <laughs> and it actually seems like a really good thing to do today, or to have done today. Um, and I remember being on a flight about a year into my uh, career at Delta Airlines, and I met the CEO of the company who was a ma just marvelous patriarch. And he introduced himself to me and said, tell me a little bit about yourself. And I said, well, you know, I'm just here for a year. I, I'm going to leave and I'm going to go do some really meaningful work. <laughs> <laughs> and he smiled and said, I'd like for you to come by my office, <laughs> probably to fire me. <laughs> I'd like for you to come by my office because I'd like to share with you a few jobs that we have in mind for you um, because I really see something in you that, and maybe you will in us, that might be meaningful. So I remember getting off that flight thinking, wow, I'll, he'll never take my phone call, but he did. And I visited with Dave Garrett and he laid out four jobs and one was managing human resources and that was the beginning of a 30-year career. The beginning of a 30-year career. I worked my way from being a flight attendant at Delta Airlines to being the third highest ranking person in the company. And I can tell you, I know kind of the shame, despair, and humiliation of what it feels like to be without hope. I also um, know what it feels like to win and to belong and have and have the knowledge that to know that you can achieve a lot. Um, I'll, I'll share with you one other quick story which kind of shows a little bit about my career. I, I had the good fortune of uh, running um, most of the operations for the company. 52,000 people around the world, uh, all the airports, all the call centers, um, and when I uh, got the responsibility or was promoted into the job of running all the airports, I went in, as I typically do, into the field and met with all of the folks. There were only about 5% of the people that were working in airports that were women. 95% were men. So I was down on the ramp with all of the um, agents, and we were doing meetings. And I remember the... A guy that was the head of operations said, who was actually a very good friend of the former leader, and he said, you know, Vicki, in front of like a hundred men, he said, Vicki, 
I don't think you even have the um, knowledge to carry Marty Graham's shoes, which was the former leader. So I remember thinking, how am I going to get out of this? And I, and, I, and I said, you know, Dave, it may be interesting to you to know that I had no interest in carrying Marty's shoes. And that was, the, that was actually the beginning of a great, great friendship um, with Dave Huss. Um, Anyhow, I, um, I'm getting a sign here that I need to pick up the pace. I want to tell a few more stories and wrap this up because we have a great vision for this wonderful organization. Uh, so I worked at Delta for close to 30 years, was promoted into the job of chief marketing officer a week before 9-11. We could talk for hours about that. It was a very challenging time. Um, but I knew at that time that there were other things waiting for me. So three years later, I... Um, had the good fortune of leaving. I worked for the mayor of Atlanta for about a year as her chief of staff. And during that time, she took on public education for the city of Atlanta. It did not directly report to her. And um, I remember sitting in the back of her car. She went to visit every school in the city of Atlanta because the graduation rate of kids, seniors, was 40%. She gave them her phone number, these seniors and said, call me because you need to get a job, go to college, or go to technical training. Well, of course, these kids are calling her left and right, right? And I'm like, Mayor, what are you doing? And she said, Vicki, I believe in the power of one. I believe that every one of us can make a difference. And when are you going to take your talents and gifts and really make a difference in the world? And that was God speaking to me very loudly. So I left that um, opportunity with her, and I started actively looking for nonprofits where I could make a difference in helping people. I had the good fortune of being selected as the CEO of America's Second Harvest, which eventually was Feeding America. And I worked there for six and a half years um, through the work of a fabulous team and a wonderful strategy. We actually grew the organization from $28 million of uh, revenue to over, to right at $100 million. We doubled the number of people that we were serving in this country from 25 million to almost, uh, to almost 40 million people. It was nothing short of amazing and it was all about the power of one. Uh, we did it through um, a real strong focus on a plan that we followed relentlessly. We measured our progress and our success, and we did it through the generosity of people that really bought in to the message of providing people hope in this country. Um, I could talk a long time about that, but I won't. It was a fabulous... Uh, opportunity and it really led me to where I am today, which is not um, by chance. Um, I believe strongly that I am here for a reason um, and am honored to be with you all and to have a chance to lead. Um, we've talked a lot about our team on the ground. I would tell you they're simply marvelous. Uh, from Cosmos to Effie to Enrique in Colombia. Uh, they're smart and well-educated and successful. And it is the same throughout the world. Um, but we have a lot of work to do to really build this organization. Um, and I want to share with you in my closing moments a few of my ideas. Uh, with, as I said, three billion people living in poverty, half women and girls, living on less than $2 a day, we simply must change the fact that opportunity is the best kept secret in the United States. You guys agree with that? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> we must change that and we will change that. Um, we must build a fundraising strategy that takes all these wonderful people in the room with us. We're so thankful for all of you but you can't support our worldwide strategy by yourselves. And so we must bring more corporations into our work. We must bring a mid and uh, 
a mass market strategy to support our work. We must do more outreach to faith-based donors and to entrepreneurs and to women. We must develop a growth strategy that will market this strong track record for opportunity. And we must invest in the strategy of families and the strategies of women. Because you all have known and you have heard that in the developing world, 93% of the people that we serve through our loans are women. So I'm going to be working together over the next X number of years, but short term and medium term, on a strategy with our board, with Harry Turner and David Sims globally, on a sustainable and scalable growth plan. Uh, it will be a growth plan that will help us reach many more people that need our help. One part of this that you'll hear me talk about um, is technology, and we'll talk about that later today. We'll talk about agriculture, we'll talk about education, we'll talk about technology. The reason technology is so important is because it allows us to reach people in the most remote places, remote places all over the, all over the globe. And it allows us to do that efficiently and effectively and reduce our costs and make sure that we're getting that great return on the investment that we're so known for. So I would say in closing that we have a bold vision of growth and we are especially positioned to answer this call. I will be studying and listening and connecting and thinking outside the box. I want you to know I'm in this for the long haul. I've been asked that question a lot since I joined. And I hope you can see from my life that I don't take things lightly. I don't take commitments lightly. I don't take my responsibilities to you all lightly. So I'm in this for the long haul. I also want you to know that I am well aware that we are building on the shoulders of great people that have come before us, like the Whitakers, and all the other CEOs and leaders that have been in this organization have brought something good and something valuable, and we are building on their shoulders. But we hold the key to unlock the future opportunity. We're going to be more alert, more inclusive, and more welcoming. We're going to build strong and sustainable institutions. We're going to create more opportunities for families and for women. We're going to build a world in which all people have an opportunity to be successful. We have a lot of work to do. Come and help me explore the power of one to build opportunity for all. Thank you.